Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past, and present. I extend that re respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then I pay my special respect to all our fallen heroes from Spring Revolution in Myanmar. I also thank today AMI presenter and our participants from different parts of the world to join AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Chris Ruelan, will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Floor is yours. Thank you, May Chair. And uh, it's very good to see you here. This is a hardcore of people who have got a special interest in federalism, what it means. And we will do more on this subject. We, we aren't going to speak a lot today about the various alternatives there are in, in federal structure for the country, but we're going to start by assuming that the Myanmar that will come once we've got the politics stabilized will be one for a federal country. And the question really that I thought we should start with is how will we determine what it is that the people want in their federalism? We'll move from there to some more elaborate discussions about what forms of federalism are the ones most relevant for Myanmar. And then we will get help from our good friend, Dr. Chuan Shui, in bringing in the NUG uh, people who are responsible for these things to talk about exactly what they see for the future of the country. But first, we should look at how, how we should best understand what the people want. And so with that in mind, we have our speakers today and they're, they're as advertised, Michael Breen from Melbourne University, Myung Tue, who has not been in Australia very long, but who has got an extensive uh, experience with these issues in Myanmar, including with the Angkor School of Political Science. And we have as a commentator who will lead us to the next stages of our discussion of federalism in Myanmar, Dr. Tanong Tue. So, Michael, would you like to start now, please? Thank you, Chris. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, excellent. Um, so, I think we know the general situation that with decades of trying, key actors have not yet reached an agreement on a model of federalism that addresses the demands and aspirations of the different parties, different ethnic nationalities and armed groups. The situation on the ground today is, of course, quite different but I think that the issues remain much the same. Uh, key questions like, uh, what should the number and boundaries of states and regions be? Do we need new states? Uh, should there be a single Bama state? What should the powers of the states and regions be? These kind of questions remain somewhat contentious. Um, but in the main, uh, the public have not very much been part of this debate. And we might question whether they should be or whether they can be. And indeed, after many years of suppression of political discussion and the banning of discussion on federalism in particular, is public deliberation a viable path for Myanmar today? Um, so I argue that there are normative and practical reasons for doing so. I'll just bring up my slides again. Um, so the first reason, of course, is the resolution of federalism. The second is that the borders and the boundaries of the state um, in Myanmar are historical legacy that do not necessarily reflect contemporary circumstances. Uh, it's a result of the British decolonization process to a large extent. They lumped some groups together and separated others, and they were based mainly on administrative convenience uh, and, uh, from the British colonizers. So many of you would be familiar with this map on the right, um, which is where the British sought to govern directly and indirectly, directly over the Bama core and indirectly over the so-called frontier areas. These boundaries to an extent institutionalized in the Panglong Agreement and the first constitution, and then seen again in the boundaries that were put in place in the 1974 and 2008 constitutions. So they do need to be reconsidered in my view. Uh, third, one problem in Myanmar is the problem of majoritarianism, which is a common problem with democracy in ethnically divided societies. So when you have strong and distinct ethnic identities, preferences will tend to be fixed 
and to align with each other. And this can create permanent majorities and permanent minorities and polarization. And we've seen this happen in Myanmar. And it requires some kind of countervailing institution, some kind of democratic designs to overcome. One way to address this tendency is to supplement electoral and other mechanisms with forms or methods for public deliberation to establish a kind of deliberative democracy, so to speak. Um, this has been demonstrated to be able to overcome polarization and lead to more moderate and legitimate outcomes. And fifth, what the public has to say is important, of course. We know that the general public has the capacity to develop understanding and meaningfully input into a range of complex and sensitive matters. And I'll, I'll give an example shortly. Um, many constitutional processes have been um, hampered by elite only processes that sideline the public and undermine legitimacy and ultimately implementation. So the more people have been a part of a process and can see their concerns and interests incorporated or recognized, the more likely that they are to accept the outcomes and work towards implementation and long-term sustainability. So there is a kind of buy-in. Uh, one approach to ascertaining the public's informed opinion, and some of you might have seen me present on this before, is known as deliberative polling. It's been applied to problems from local government spending priorities right through to constitutional change in around 30 countries across the world and in every continent. From China to the US, from Uganda to Bulgaria, deliberative polling has been demonstrated to be able to work in any context and Myanmar is no different. So some colleagues and I tried a variation of deliberative polling uh, in 2018, and we wanted to focus on federalism. We wanted to challenge the perception that the public cannot reasonably deliberate about context and contentious matters like constitutional change and identity. So we took it on head first in a way. We chose what we thought were some of the most difficult and controversial questions, and we put those to the people. We chose federalism and the basis of the states and regions. And we also looked at the role of religion and national identity. We looked at also some more technical issues like how power should be divided. We focused on a couple of specific issues, natural resources and education. Um, our surveys also dealt with how people's knowledge improved, how their trust in other groups changed, how they felt about the situation and whether they were optimistic for the future. Um, so we wanted to create or to know what the public would think under more ideal conditions. So I'm sure we're all familiar with a regular opinion poll where you might get a random telephone call and they ask you, say, do you think Myanmar should have federalism? And you might say, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't really know much about it, but it sounds fine to me. What would people actually think once they've had that opportunity to learn more about it and to discuss um, with different, different perspectives with other people at, outside of having pressure exerted externally? So it might be peer pressure, it might be a dominant group, it might be pressure from uh, the strength of arms or economic strength. And so we try to create ideal conditions. The process normally has several steps. There's the selection process. You try and get a representative sample. Uh, we did some different events, some with the general public, some with local elites. Normally they're done with the general public. Uh, then there is a pre-event briefing package and a survey. And then people gather together for an event. There's a, a presentation and a question and answer, and we make sure that all the information is balanced, does not bias one group to another. Uh, there are rules for deliberation, moderated small group discussions. So I actually did not engage in any discussions. Um, I answered some sort of factual questions and that was about all. Report backs and large group surveys, and then they do the same survey again, and we see how opinions have changed. And this opinion, is what we might call a more genuine opinion. And you can even extrapolate from a regular opinion poll. So you could do some of these, you could do a regular opinion poll, and then you can go, okay, so if, if we changed you know, people's preference for federalism, say went up 20% after deliberation, so we can 
assumed that the regular opinion poll people might be 20% more in favour um, had they had the opportunity to learn and discuss. Um, a quick acknowledgement of some of the project teams and partners. Uh, you can see there's quite a few here. We had a lot of local partners and also the University of Mandalay um, were integral to this process. Uh, quickly on a couple of findings, just to give you an example of how it works. Uh, so Myanmar, we talked about national identity and religion. And you can see here in the diagram on the right how people's opinions changed uh, between the first and the second survey as a result of the education process and the deliberations. Uh, so dotted line, people uh, preferred after deliberations more of having a single shared identity. And then before, and in terms of religion, the support for Buddhism in the constitution declined. So they changed in quite consistent ways uh, because having a state identity based on Buddhism is of course um, exclusive of the identities of those who are, are not Buddhists. Um, a second example here is about the states and regions. And again, these all changed quite consistently across different questions, but also across different ethnic groups, across the different poles and locations. And we found something that was quite surprising in a sense. We did not expect uh, these results. We expected that people's preferences for an ethnic basis to federalism would go up because uh, in the main ethnic nationalities were a majority of um, four out of five of our deliberative events. But the same change happens regardless of who was in, in a majority or, or a minority. Um, we found that people tended to not prefer after deliberation a kind of ethnic federalism. They wanted more territorial bases for states. They wanted less self-administered areas. So this was quite surprising and, and leads us to question in a sense whether the public really want a kind of ethnic federalism anymore. Um, but perhaps most importantly, we found that the approach works. Deliberation works in a deeply divided context. It works with both the general public and the elites. Um, participants develop knowledge, they improve their knowledge, and they were able to understand some quite complex issues around, for example, natural resource sharing. They were open and they were reasoned. People told us that it was one of the first, or no, the first safe space that they had had to discuss these kind of issues with members um, from different ethnic groups. So there had been lots of in-house discussions, but people hadn't actually discussed it with those who might have different opinions. And ultimately they showed a willingness to compromise and to change their preferences. And what we saw was a coming together of opinions. So if you look at this diagram here, the Bama started out with a preference for more centralization and then the post-deliberation preference shifted to prefer more decentralization. And the opposite happened with ethnic nationalities who shifted to prefer a little more decentralization. So um, now I think that this is the kind of public opinion that needs to be fed into elite negotiations. And indeed, I think these kind of processes can actually work with elite negotiations as well. Um, it can help people to find innovative solutions. And we saw some of that in our events. Um, but it helps bring people's opinions closer together. It doesn't overcome all the differences of opinions, but it does overcome um, uh, some of the polarization. So obviously it's hard to engage, profoundly more difficult to engage the public in the circumstances that we have now, um, but, but it, is, it is possible for people to engage in these kind of difficult questions. Public opinion is critically important and needs to be listened to. Um, so I will finish up there. Um, and obviously, I'm happy to take questions, take questions on any aspect, on any aspect of, that. of that. And I'll pass and I'll over pass to Mira Trey. Um, Trey. Thank you very much. So, Myung Trey, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Myung Trey, a former political prisoner and practitioner uh, who recently arrived in uh, Australia. Uh, now I'm learning uh, community service in RMIT University. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to <clears throat> thank uh, EMI, Australian Myanmar Institute, for letting me uh, to join uh, in this discussion. And especially, I appreciate uh, Chris 
uh, who brought me into this discussion. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, I I think that I'm not a uh actually I'm not a how can I say academic and I'm just a practitioner and yes um uh ex I just as uh in 1998 1988 uprising democracy uprising I was a student activist and and I uh I was in prison for uh for a long time and then I established a a young school of political science and then uh, uh after 30 years yes uh during the participating in the political activities uh i left Burma and now i'm here so uh in today's discussion i'm not very focusing on the discussions on the academic things i just uh discuss uh about the, uh, my experience on on conducting the public opinion in myanmar so during 10 years of civilian government, uh, I have been conducting several public opinions uh, pullings in Myanmar. So I think uh, uh, public, doing the conducting the public opinions pullings is uh, uh, is very important uh, to raise the public awareness of the um, participating in the policy making and uh, policy making process and show to get the voice of the uh, publics uh, to have to be had uh, their uh, their voice to be had for the uh, policy makers. So, uh, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it is in my opinion that unfortunately, uh, it is um, uh, uh, depends on my experience. Yeah, most public, uh, most policymakers in Myanmar, uh, in my country, have not been very interested in the result of the public opinions pullings and uh, less trust on it. So it is very, how can I say, difficult to engage them and organize advocate them for the public opinions and the result of the ten. And so, uh, we try to engage them and we try to uh, deliver uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the result of the public opinions. And so, yes, uh, this is what I have experienced. But uh, in my opinion, I, I think it is, how can I say, uh, very important uh, uh, doing the uh, public opinions pooling is uh, to raise the awareness of the people and how can I say, to participate then into the political process, policy making, I think. So, uh, so when, um, uh, now I would like to share some experience of uh, my experience on doing the public opinions. Yeah. So why we are conducting the public opinions? Well, it is very important that we have used the high quality uh, research methodology and have the best practice and management uh, during the survey process. Yes. So this is I uh, as I just only participated in the management of the pool. I am not discussing about the research methodology. Um, on doing it. So I think I'm just, uh, I'm not uh, authorized to discuss such kind of things. So I will discuss about the best management and the practice in the pooling uh, process. Uh, the first thing which is very important is uh, questionnaire developing. And we have to make sure the questions uh, uh, we are asking are clear or uh, understandable to ordinary people. So it is very important are uh, important uh, for them. So, you know, so in our country, there are a lot of ethnic cities and tribes. So each ethnic cities has uh, different languages and different dialects. Uh, firstly, uh, we have to make questionnaires clear and understandable to common languages. Uh, like uh, it's official language like Myanmar people. So then, in some cases, we try to translate into other ethnic languages, uh, but you know, so uh, not all. And so some majority groups of ethnic peoples, uh, we translate uh, into uh, the questionnaire into it. Uh, then uh, we did the pilot survey and pilot pooling some practices, uh, practices in the, uh, in the um in the field work but 
uh, then uh, we have series of options for the questionnaire development and studying the result of the uh, pooling <coughs> pilot poolings. Uh, the second important one is the training fee, supervisor and enumerator. Yes, mostly uh, the questionnaire we are asking in the survey are about politics, uh, economics, federalism, and some very complex issues. Yes, to ask them to ask ordinary people. So it is very organized, complex things to ask. So, so we need to make sure that the enumerator really understand the questions they are going to ask uh, to other people. So our crew must be smart and well-trained. So mostly uh, we choose our enumerator from the university students and so volunteer as a volunteer. So we train our members, especially to follow the rules and uh, techniques of the fee works and maintain the ethics of the ethics of the survey. So the third important one is quality control. Usually we found a QC team, a quality control team. So the quality control team is to check in the answer book uh, at the office and then they go to the fee work and then uh, they check back the respondent answer. So <clears throat> this is uh, what is my organization, uh, what is the field work and management and best practice of the poolings, uh, uh, the conducting the public opinion uh, poolings. Uh, right now, I would like to discuss what I learned from my experience uh, during the uh, uh, poolings. So uh, I think uh, uh, we were able to make some uh, some successful uh, in some instance uh, are doing uh, the public opinions pool in Myanmar, but you know it is very difficult to deliver the message of the public opinions to the policymakers uh, in our country. So one important thing, uh, important thing I, I have learned uh, in my work is that uh, it is very important to see the result of the Respondent, they didn't answer. We must notice how much the rate of no answer on each question. So let's say the question like which party, what parties would you like to support in next election or a leader would you like to support? So uh, the question like this, like, so uh, it might be uh, a lot of no answer uh, on this question. So it is, uh, it is because of, um, it means that the answer they don't answer is the answer for us. Uh, it is might be because of their fears and pressure on them and something overwhelming on them. So uh, in our uh, organizations, uh, during the uh, analyzing uh, the research, so uh, it is very uh, important to see uh, the answer like this. So when we do the analyze on it, so this is the very important message on it. So now, so this is just our, uh, our gonna say is, um, I, I think so uh, the, doing the public opinion service uh, in the democracy process is uh, very important. And so asking the, organization question people to the organization what they want to get uh, what we want to uh, would like to be uh, is very important uh, so uh, yes so public opinion survey pooling is very important and raise the uh, raise the awareness yeah public awareness is so uh, right now uh, I would like to how can I say is uh, deliver uh, uh, my message uh, to the organization current situations uh, to the meeting attendees and thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So. Yeah. So this is ten minutes. I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll come back to you when we get to question time. But now we need to hear a few comments from Dr. Tunong Shui. Not many, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so your presentation and the studies are very, very interesting. And also, uh, I wanted to highlight the Myanmar people believe perception and the knowledge related to federalism is evolving. So when 1947, when General Aung and Pasapala prepared the 1947 constitution, the Burma, the state was formed based on the uh, proper Burma and also the frontier area, frontier administration and then the independent Karenni states. So that is why in 1947, national flags missing some staff for the major ethnic groups. And then 1974, it changed a little bit. And then 1988, and then the 2008 constitution changed a lot. So in nowadays, the people understanding perception and the belief on the federalism is really uh, interesting and changing a lot. So that would be really good to do the study again, cross-sectional study on what Michael and Gomiantri did. So there will be a, a trend on the Nema people belief and perception on the federalism. So nowadays we know that the NUCC and NUG prepare the Federal Democracy Charter, part one and part two. So in the part one, there are very strong basic principle for the future federal democratic new Nema. So if you, if you look at the Federal Democracy Charter part one, they are very strong principle for Federal Democratic Union. From my point of view, it is more clear and stronger than what leaders signed in the Pin Loan Agreement in 1947. So it's stronger and clearer than the Pin Loan, Pin Loan Agreement, the Federal Democracy Charter. So I really encourage to do the, another study on study on the Myanmar people belief and perception and understanding of the democracy and federalism. I do believe there will be a lot of changes among Myanmar people on understanding. Thank you so much. Good, thank you. We move to questions and answers. First of all, though, uh, and we need to see how many questions there are. First of all, I should say that uh, in our discussions from AMI with politicians in Australia, including at the state level. One of the things that I've talked about with them and we've discussed a little is the, the way Australia is united as a federation on the basis these days of a multicultural democracy. So that ethnicity or ethnic background is of much less relevance than before. And we've seen similar things done in the sporting arena, for example, in, in football, soccer, uh, there was a time when the soccer teams in Australia were built very heavily on an ethnic base. That's all been taken apart by Football Australia. And although it's not completely successful, it's been a very big help to getting football to operate in this way. And I know this is something which will interest Tanong Shui because of his own interest in Football United and the way that functions in Myanmar. But the, the opportunity to have the whole of the public coming together without regard to ethnic boundaries is something which we can see in Australia. And the work that's been done on multiculturalism here is something which I think, if we were able to manage ourselves properly, especially with the state parliaments and state governments, we could bring information to Myanmar about the way that's functioned here and what it might mean. As for Myanmar itself, in all my experience of the country, dating back all these years, one of the things that I've seen again and again is something or other which uh, carries with it the baggage of the British colonial era. And so, Michael, your map of, uh, of British Burma amidst the, if I can use the, uh, the term loosely, protectorates and self-governing regions with British India next door is a very good illustration of why the country is where it is now. So let's move to questions. Um, there was a question about whether, uh, and I don't know, Zhang uh, Shui, whether you're even able to answer this easily. Uh, do you see, or does NUG see, the, the boundaries that were set essentially by Ne Win for his 1974 constitution as the boundaries which will remain in the future federal Myanmar? First of all, I would like to highlight NUG is interim government. So, first February 2021, 
the, the military uh, took power. So that is why NUT is the interim government. So within the very limited capacity, we are just focusing on the two main objectives. The first one is to eliminate the military dictatorship in Myanmar, the first objective. Second, to build federal democratic union. So the question is in line with the second objective, but we are stating in Trump government. So we are trying to eliminate the military. At the same time, we are trying to promote the federalism and democratic values among all the stakeholders. So at this stage, we already developed the, the 12 step political roadmaps that is clearly highlighted in the second part of the, the Federal Democratic Charter. So in that charter, yeah. There are three phases in Trump phase, transitional phase, and the full fledged federal democratic union phase. So, answer to the question how are we going to demarcate the boundaries and then the self administrative area, that should be discussed within the constitutional assembly, not within the NUG. NUG is, has no rights to do this kind of thing. For example, Rohingya issue. If we have to discuss about Rohingya, definitely we do need a Rohingya representative and then Rakhine representative and then other key stakeholder of Myanmar. So in, in this stage, in NUG government and UCC, Arakan army, very powerful military wing of the ALP, is cooperating with so many areas, but not on the not fully engaged, not on board. Without American Army representative, are we fair to discuss about Rohingya issue and boundary? Without true representative from the Rohingya community, are we fair to discuss about their future? So that is why this kind of issue must be discussed. And it is essential, it is mandatory at the transitional phase. During the trans transitional phase, there will be new government will come in based on the transitional phase constitution. So that transitional phase constitution is now drafting within the NUCC. So that newly formed transitional government will call a constitutional assembly like General Aosan and Pasapala called public uh, generous, uh, public constitutional assembly in 1947, the same, the same concept. And then that constitutional assembly would discuss all the constitutional issues, including the boundary, and then the federal union town, we should call them everything. There will be in the constitutional assembly, the true representative of the each and every uh, ethnic groups and then other actors, they will formulate the new constitution, then referendum, then the general election. That is why it is very early to say for the demarcation of the boundary and then the self administrative area. So for the moment, in Trump government, duty is to eliminate the military dictators and then build the formula, uh, foundation for the 12 step roadmaps. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, of course, one of the complications in all of this is that when the military are gone uh, and say the NUG is able to form a transitional government, then what happens at the level of the states and the regions? Do they do you reinstitute the existing boundaries just for the purpose of government while the constituent assembly does its work? And if you do that, how's that how's that going to work out? Is that something which has been thought about by the by the NUG? Yes, of yes, course. Of that course. is why, why. Uh, parallel uh, process. Parallel. We are uh, trying to eliminate the military by military means and by the means. At the same time, uh, the one of the parallel processes, the, the formulation of the uh, constitutional uh, transitional phase constitution. So now the key actors in the Myanmar Spring Revolution, they are now drafting the uh, transitional phase constitution. That constitution must guarantee for this kind of new federal democratic union. 
So at that constitution, should grant the must grant the for this sort of issue to sort of in this transitional phase. Good, thank you. We have a couple more questions coming in now. Uh, the the neighbours, India on one side, Bangladesh, I suppose, China on the other, Thailand, they would be intensely interested in what sort of a setup uh, Myanmar has in in its future. And I do remember from my time as ambassador there that the Chinese embassy was very interested in what was going to happen, in particular the way the Shan state would be governed in the future. And I should suppose those sorts of concerns or interests remain. Uh, do you see, Zhang Shui, any contact with China and India in looking at the way these uh, ethnicities, and I don't want to call them minorities because it's the wrong word to use, that these, these ethnicities might be governed and what the sensitivities might be of the neighboring states? I would like to share with you the, what's happening now. For example, in current states, there is a current government, currently in Trump Consultative Council. That council is acting like a, a, the state parliament of the current. So similar situation, similar setup in, in, in Kitchen states, in Korean states, and also uh, other states and uh, other regions like the Nindari mainland of Myanmar. So, and then you may aware that, we are aware that Western Democratic, Liberal Democratic Airlines, US, UK, EU, deploying ASEAN at the driving seat to resolve the uh, Myanmar crisis. At the same time, you may see 14 of, uh, 13 of March, a few weeks ago, Thai government organized a non-ASEAN meeting to resolve Myanmar. And then they call it, there is neighbor, meeting of the neighbor of Myanmar. So Bangladesh, India, send their delegates to the, to the meeting. So Thai is also setting up a, another channel to resolve the crisis in Myanmar. Another parallel channel is China. So you, we all know that China, Chinese government, special envoy to Myanmar, he had a shuttle visit between Myanmar, Nipiro, and then the China, Myanmar Bora, ethnic arms organization, he called series of meeting. And then now there is another parallel channel to resolve the crisis in Myanmar. Similarly, India government, India factor is also very important. Obviously, Myanmar military receiving some military equipment and support from India government, very obvious. So there is another factor. So Myanmar crisis is multifaceted and then the very complex situation. But as an NUG staff, I would like to, but I'm not biased on the NUG, but I, I like to highlight that. The 12 step roadmaps is a one and only sustainable solution for the protracted conflict in Myanmar. That's all the Indonesian actors and also the national actor as well need to understand that. Because we are in the conflict, protracted conflict for 70 years. And then this national Myanmar spring bring a really great opportunity to understand each other, to sympathize and to empathize each other. And then all the people know that harmonization is a tool used by Myanmar military to divide and rule. And then that uh, make the military rules longer in Myanmar. So now people understand what does it mean Myanmar harmonization? And then what does it mean focus strategy? What does it mean uh, Federalism. So before the military coup in 2021, many Myanmar people understand that federalism is a separation, secession is to, 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 to depart from the mainland of Myanmar. But nowadays, many people in Myanmar understand that federalism is not a separation. Federalism is living together with equality and equity. So that is why there are so many factors and so many channels led by various actors 
to resolve the Myanmar crisis, but the first political roadmap is the one and only solution, sustainable solution to resolve the protracted conflict in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Now, the one of the things that uh, occurs to me is that the Myanmar diaspora living in Australia are living in a federation and living and experience a federation every day of their lives in Australia. I'd like to know what they may think about the situation we're discussing tonight. And so Ko Solzman, who's from the NUG support group in Australia, is here with us today. And I invite him to offer some views. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, I just wanted to comment um, uh, the comment on the, uh, the situation in Burma right now. Um, the international community must understand that um, when the roof is leaking, we need to fix the roof, not looking around buckets to hold the water. You know, at the moment, the whole situation is the military is the main problem. All the federalism, everything that occur created by the, uh, the military. So I think some, um, it's, we, we, in Burmese words, we, uh, people saying, uh, or even in English word, uh, ethnic minority, ethnic minority. They are, the words people use that's not inclusive, they are not minority. If we want everyone to be all equal, they are one of us, you know? So I think Sam, uh, that what I wanted to say is that the situation about federalism is created the problem by the military. We need to fix that. So I think um, um, with the, uh, it's even with the education uh, system, we have been brainwashed. They are Chin or Chin said something, Corinne said something. Those sort of even just for daily language we use, it's a, a big problem. These are the created by the military. So I think some, um, as I said before, the, the, when the roof is leaking, we need to fix the roof first. So that's the, the, the main problem we are, we're facing at the moment. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Solzman. That's an important comment because one of the things that I saw there and still see here, when people are Burma and term Burma, I know why, uh, they naturally think when they look at the country from the side of Burma and the Burmese, the Bama. They don't think that this necessarily encompasses the. I'm interested in how that's all going to play out. And the views of the, of the diaspora are interesting because I've seen since the military took over, in particular since then, a big growth in the way the population comes together. They, they have a united ambition of getting rid of the military government. And they're willing to do, as John Shui suggests, and look to the future for what that future should be. But I'd like to hope that they can come to do that looking on the basis of good experience of what works and what does not. They've got plenty of experience of what does not by looking at their own country. But how to build something from that is going to be a very difficult issue to run with. Uh, another person who has views about these things and uh, is in the diaspora here, and she's quite a good, important public figure for the diaspora, is the wonderful Tintanu from uh, New South Wales. Who, uh, from you're, you're here, Tintanu. Can you hear me now? She was in the media not so long ago. There was a very good and interesting story about her and her work in on the 20th of March in the ABC. But she oh, is interested oh, in you. what can thank be you. done to undivide the country and bring it together again. Tintanu, I'm interested in your views on the situation we're discussing because I know that you think that there's a lot of problems caused by division. How can that be brought back together? But the main, main culprit is the you know, military. They let the Bamas divide it between us and the Koreans and whatsoever. Um, you have when I was in the university, I have many you know, ethnic students and they, they do not think the same, although maybe I am just you know uh, 
dealing with the more educated uh, people. But when I go to, you know, to the uh, regional areas, uh, uh, in Shan states and uh, in the villages, I do a lot of uh, surveying for my agriculture economics uh, students. Um, they, they seem to be just normal people. But of course, uh, right now we are all against the military. The only thing is if, if we are talking about different uh, ethnic uh, conditions, then uh, uh, maybe we should start to do uh, educate the people. Of course, we all know that we have to be against the military and we are all united in that front. But uh, uh, then uh, for this uh, condition, when we got the uh, get rid of the military, I think we should start to have much more uh, cooperation or, and have some co cohesion among all of us. I think right since now, we should start doing some, you know, with some civil, civil society to get the people um, you know, do some capacity building. Right now, what I'm doing in my, uh, uh, whatever I can do is I'm trying to build some libraries in Bago Division and it's going to be replicated in many uh, uh, areas around the uh, Bago Division. And that is uh, to get the people know, the youth know, and the, people who come and uh, you know borrow the books from the little libraries that I have sponsored to set up, understand we should all be united. I think we should start from the grassroots and what I'm trying to do at the moment from here. I just, uh, I think we should do a lot of capacity building. That's my idea. One of my uncles, he was a minister of home affairs and I went to, I went to uh, with him to do Malme and the, the, we have a dancing and whatever. And they said, if the minister does not let us do things that we want, we will be, we will be separated from, our, from Burma. They said that, but I don't know why uh, uh, as a child, I don't know what, what's happening. But since then we have some conflicts I know uh, set up by the communists or whatever that, that, that happened. Uh, but also when I was even studying in University of New England, Armadale, I met some Thai, Thai, uh, person, uh, Thai person, one of my friends. He said he works in the Thai military uh, and he gave a training to Shan, uh, military, Shan uh, milit militia. So we have been, uh, you know, unknown things behind, but then uh, maybe in a positive way, the military has divided us and now they have done so badly, we become united. And that's what I've seen, uh, what uh, Peggy has said, Mayor uh, Alnai and his army. We are now one. Thank you, Peggy. You, Peggy. That, that's right. Thank, thank you for that. I think this, uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, but this takes me back to Michael. One of the things that's happened in the country uh, in the last 10 years, is the rapid spread to everybody of the internet and the ability to use smartphones and communicate with each other. This has gone right across the ethnicities of the country and I think has probably created a basis for a unity that wasn't there before. And perhaps, Michael, at the time that you were there, in your survey work, the internet was not as well established as it is now. Do you see the internet as a useful tool for gauging public feeling about what the Federation should look like in the future? And if so, how would you um, use thank it? Um, Chris, thank um, that's really important. Um, and absolutely the internet, it will, in a place, the situation in Myanmar, Myanmar now, and also the remoteness of, of many areas, irrespective of the security situation, um, means that the internet does provide quite a lot of opportunity. And my, my thoughts would be to stick with this deliberative sort of idea and not just, and, and so you can really systematize it. And deliberative polling is over the last few years, they have been trying to do it um, through the internet. So they have been able to um, run the education component and then they have been able to do the surveys and then they bring people together to discuss and they do the re repeat surveys again. And they're finding that it still works in this kind of situation. So that's um, one way to overcome that. Um, if I can just digress briefly, 
um, we asked our participants about secession, which has come up. And the, I think the comment earlier was federalism was equated with secession. And it was people thought initially federalism will lead to secession, but after learning more and discussing, they really changed that opinion. And it is an unfortunate fact that in some cases, federalism has led to secession. So it's not a completely baseless claim. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. And that's, there's a, what we call the paradox of federalism. On the one hand, it makes secession less likely because groups are getting the autonomy getting self-determination and recognition of rights. But on the other hand, it can increase it because it consolidates that sense of a distinct identity potentially. And it also um, enables groups to, or states, regions to amass resources with which they could mount a secessionist movement. So the question then becomes, how do you prevent secession or manage secession is through federal design. And one of the ways you do that is through bringing a lot of people on board. Um, and you find that they have more moderate opinions and more inclusive kind of ideas after they've had the chance to discuss that. Thanks. That's very wise. And in fact, as I recall, and I don't have it in front of me, but the 1947 constitution created a secession possibility, which is one of the conditions or semi-conditions of the Panglong Agreement. And that uh, built this belief that there was, you could equate secession with federation or vice versa. And so it needs to be dealt with very differently in future. And in a way that 1974 constitution did do that, but it's not enough. Okay, I think we have come to as far as we can go in this hour. So I'm very grateful to our speakers, to Michael, to Myung Tui, and of course to Dr. Tun Ong Shui. And Tun, I'll talk to you before too long about the successor to this when we have someone from the NUG Ministry of Federal Affairs to speak uh, authoritatively from them about what they're doing. And I, I'm interested in doing these things because it's possible to have sessions in this seminar series, one after the other, about the horrors and the crimes being committed by the military. No doubt there, that's possible. But on the other hand, I think that as AMI, we need to also look forward. So we will mix these things around and do some looking forward at the same time as condemning the crimes of the present. But thank you, everybody, very much. And I look forward to seeing you all in a month. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.